see a little pop up. There you go, that's new. Uh, welcome to those of you joining us on um, YouTube or wherever you're seeing us now. All right. Um, we want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everyone. Contact me for more information on sponsoring some webinars. If you work for a business or you know of a business that might be interested in sponsoring webinars. You can also help keep these webinars free. At the end, you're gonna be taken to a page with a bunch of resources on things you might be interested in, um, such as our native plant guide, our rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. If you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help TCF continue to do all of the awesome stuff that we do because we do so much more than just webinars. You can also check the box to become a member and then you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff, such as our recent plant sale members got in a day early. All right, we have been doing these webinars ever since last March and we're gonna keep doing them as long as people keep attending. So uh, some upcoming webinars, we've got some really exciting ones and I've got some really cool ones in the works. Um, but next week on June 2nd, we'll be talking about green exercise. What is it and why does it matter? With a uh, with physical therapist, Allison Mitch, uh, another in our continuing series of Nature Rx programs. And then on June 9th, we will be joined by um, the IDNR to talk about the rich natural history of Northeast Illinois, federally threatened and endangered species. So find out more about those guys who are in danger, in peril, and uh, maybe what you can do about it. All right, with that, I am going to turn it over now to our friend Chris with Green Gorilla. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you. So I am going to mute and I'll stop my video and you can mm -hmm. take it away. All right, sounds great. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Flaherty. Um, I own Green Gorilla, an eco friendly land management company uh, here in Elgin, Illinois. Um, Eco-friendly land management can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, um, but we're, we are a land management service um, that provides alternatives to traditional um, practices and methods that are used. So one of the things that we do is we use no gasoline and weekly lawn maintenance. Uh, we work with native plants. We specialize in native plant garden designs and maintenance. Um, so I'm going to take you through some examples of this type of work, some different applications that we've done um, in a short video that I've prepared um, for everyone. Um, different techniques. Uh, some of the things that we do are pretty consistent, like using uh, compost. Uh, we try to go pesticide free whenever possible um, and be strategic with uh, planting and using native plants in uh, different types of settings. So I am going to share my screen. I'm not very fluent at Zoom, so please bear with me here. So Okay, so like I said, the, our name is Green Gorilla, Eco-Friendly Land, Man, Land Management. Um, we are recognized and awarded by the Sustainability Commission of the City of Belgium in 2019 for Eco-Friendly Land Management Practices. Um, so it was a nice little award, a little recognition in our first year of business. Make sure everyone's still awake. Uh, with our first project, we'll start in Batavia, Illinois. It's our largest turf to native garden project, a natural area project that we've done. Uh, we Again, we use pesticide-free turf removal, premium compost soil amendment, and strategic native plant placement and design like we do in most gardens. Uh, this was a 15,000 square foot area that we're uh, taking away turf along the Fox River bike trail and Fox River itself. 
uh, and making it into a micro prairie. Um, you can see here, uh, residents also own the riverbank as well. So we had a riverbank restoration service uh, with this. We use manual and mechanical vegetation removal to not use pesticides. It's extensive work. We worked alongside the homeowner, or I should say the homeowner worked alongside us to do this work. Um, and you can see the difference here, all the vegetation removed, the shrubby stuff. We even went, in, went into the river itself and did trash removal and cleanup. Pause it right here. Um, here, uh, we're back at the top of the garden area. Um, and you can see now that the ground is bare and we removed the turf. We used a side cutter, we rolled it up and we removed it uh, and we started removing it from the property. We have this big pile of dirt that you might see right here. This is actually the compost that we use um, as a top dressing and a soil amendment for the new plug plantings, just so the soil can retain moisture. It's a natural fertilizer with uh, introducing beneficial microbes to the soil. Um, so we amended this whole area that everywhere that you don't see grass, we put compost, um, which is a large scope of the area here that you can see taking it away. And we actually take, we took it away and we composted the turf. So kind of creating that compost circle that's so important. Um, you can see all this material here, a lot of work, a lot of prep, a lot of work comes in the beginning. So very extensive. Here, I'm, oh, you can see some of these beehives too that are part of the property as well. Um, here, I'm gonna pause it. We have a, have a short video. This is Jenny. She did the majority of the work down on the riverbank and riverbank restoration. So um, I am gonna share the audio. I hope, it, I, let me know if you can't hear it. Hi, it's Jenny. I'm here at our Batavia yard conversion and riverbank naturalization project. This is the river garden as we've started calling it. It's very near completion. So I'd like to just point out what we've done here, show you what species are here and talk a little bit about the techniques that we've used. So most of what you see here, kind of at the top part of the slope are sedges, water loving, moisture loving sedges, three different kinds, Lake Bank sedge, Frank sedge and Fox sedge. Um, these will be great at controlling erosion um, as you can see, it slopes down to the river, so those root systems will hold that soil in place and do the job and they'll also look really pretty and bushy. Similar to this one, that's fully established, so that's, that will be the most consistent look here. Along the log, we have some flowering plants that will grow very large and have really pretty flowers. Um, this is a native hibiscus called swamp mallow, so that's planted in little groups all along. There's also marsh blazing star, which has a purple flower and grows to pretty great heights and is very showy as well. So those will be featured in the front. Down by the edge of the water, you can see these fan-like plants here are clusters of native irises and sweet flag. So these will work well in groups and have flowers as well, purple flowers and white flowers. You can see these are planted in a colony all along this lobe. Down on the actual edge of the bank is water willow, which is plugged into the side. Again, great for erosion control, great habitat for fish and other wildlife. You can see this site already had some mature colonies of water willow, so we were grouping along where those were already thriving. There's another big cluster out there and another cluster behind. So all along those plants are along the edge and over here one last plant to point out is our colony of canada rush which kind of swoops along here all the way down on the edge that will actually grow up in the water it'll be submerged and has kind of a nice delicate look and brings your dragonflies and damselflies so here we go thanks for watching see you next time So that's the riverbank restoration. The compost had been amended, amended the original vegetation removed, and introduction of uh, many different water loving plants uh, that you saw down there on the riverbank uh, that Jenny did. Um, we also have this right above. We call this the moist meadow. 
Again, more water loving plants, a little bit more grasses in this area, um, along with the homers here. So we use a lot of different different plants for different areas. We used 5,300, we planted 5,300 plugs on this in this garden in this natural area. We use there are five different areas. We use the unique plant selections and designs in these areas for shade, for full sun, for moist meadow, uh, for riverbank, oh, also along with the bees. So um, yeah, so that's that's one of the uh, larger turf to native residential uh, jobs I think you'll see really uh, 15,000 square feet in Batavia, Illinois, uh, on the Fox River bike trail and Fox River itself. Uh, it was really a real exciting job, a uh, great opportunity for a uh, green grill. I'm really, really happy to do it. Um, one thing I do want to say about this project, um, we planted all these plants and, um, you know, and we took the turf away, um, but, you know, completion and success is, uh, is far from done, you know, or the work is far from done. So with these homeowners here, um, you know, they, their, their understanding of this and knew that continued maintenance, you know, just like most property, you know, all property really needs continued maintenance. Um, so um, we're back at this property regularly, uh, right for the first year, every two weeks, weeding, uh, monitoring, documenting, and uh, just helping to, and promote the growth of all these different plants. Um, you know, planting, uh, planting by plug is better than planting by seed for success rate, but even with plugs, you don't get 100% success rate. So it's always important to monitor, to weed, and promote growth, um, and identify any problems that might be ha happening in your native garden. Um, I'll move on to a couple of uh, other examples of native gardens that we've done, projects that we've done. I think the next one here uh, will be in Algonquin, Illinois. Uh, this one is a front yard turf to native. So um, this was actually, uh, this customer is actually Chris Kyos, the newly elected president for the um, Conservation Foundation, I'm sorry, for King County Forest Reserve Park District. Um, and so we're changing um, part of his front yard um, to pollinators. Um, and this is, done you know to promote biodiversity to create habitat but another part of doing it in the front yard is being an example and showing your neighbors what can be done in sustainable land management and what can be the, the new norm so having all this grass not having all this grass and putting natives is okay and the more people that do it the more normal it would become and um and it empowers and it's an example and um that it's very powerful uh, as far as restoration and providing habitat for these endangered species. Um, so we're taking away turf again, amending, amending with compost, and then putting in a native plant garden um, with a aesthetic, you know, aesthetic pleasing um, design. Uh, we have some red chokeberries, we have some grasses in here, um, I believe some June grass, um, prairie smoke in the front, uh, butterfly milkweed along the front low line. So another front yard to native garden. Other native gardens uh, are used to mitigate rain, uh, not just promote biodiversity, but also to mitigate runoff rainwater. And this is one here in Elgin, Illinois that we've done this year. Uh, like you often see uh, border property lines, a lot of runoff rainwater rushing down these uh, borders. Um, and then the, kind of just like meeting uh, where all the borders of the property meet and, and creating a flooding pro uh, problem. Uh, you might see these in your neighborhood at your house, uh, but it's becoming more and more common with all this displaced runoff rainwater. So a uh, homeowner here wanted to mitigate this uh, pollution and harvest some of this rainwater by putting a uh, rain by putting a rain garden here in the back corner and along the side. Uh, along the property uh, fence line here. <clears throat> here you can see we also offer digital designs um, just for a reference so you can you know kind of know what you're expecting aesthetically with plant selections and placement. 
Uh, we do this for a lot of the um, almost all native residential gardens here again along the fence line. Um, just a visual reference. Stone, we're using stone, white indigo, heath asters, wild bergamot. Um, these are plants at maturity. And then a homeowner here has um, taken a video, um, provided us a video with uh, the rain garden at completion. Um, see, these beautiful wind chimes. Always makes it nice to work in the garden when you have wind chimes, just saying. Uh, we use Cherry Creek Stone, a lot of water loving plants down the border, um, you know, executing the design that we put in the graphics, small plants, it's going to take them a while for maturity, it's uh, not an overnight thing. And this, uh, signage, again, everybody loves signage, um, and it's important to encourage other people uh, on what you're doing, and then sometimes just reinforcing it to yourself on what you're doing, and why it's important um, to us, to our community, to our environment. We have some red osier dogwoods in the back, some purple prairie coneflower, some uh, swamp milkweed, uh, cream gentian, uh, sedges in there, a depression with a berm, rock berm, access area to the path. And then uh, along the path, just a transition between butterfly milkweed, or I'm sorry, cream gentian and prairie smoke. So that's a turf to native garden, a rain garden in Elgin, Illinois. Um, here's another one. You could just have a pollinator garden. You just want to attract all the local pollinators. And there's a lot of good reasons for this. Oh, um, there's a lot of good reasons for this. And uh, we, here's a short video um, that we put together. I'll let you guys listen in. I'll let me take over. Hello everyone, um, Chris with Green Grill again here in Geneva, Illinois. I uh, just finished up a native garden. I uh, just wanted to point out some of the unique features that we have for these gardens in this backyard that uh, you know you can use in any residential setting. So here we, uh, we transform what used to be a raised garden bed like you can see here on the sides. Uh, these raised garden beds, uh, these two were the same, they were raised, same shape. But, uh, and wood, and we re completely removed those, brought them down to ground level, and introduced this Fond du Lac stone border in, in the, to match what the existing border that was here. And then we introduced some native plants uh, for pollinator gardens. Uh, with these gardens, they, the two gardens mirror each other, the two sides mirror each other. Um, so in the middle here, just some wild bergamot, we have cream gentian, purple coneflower, uh, butterfly weed, uh, prairie, prairie drop seed, bottle brush grass, um, but in a backyard setting uh, with vegetable gardens, a complementary piece to have are pollinator gardens, so you have a high yield for vegetables and you create habitat and biodiversity for local migratory species. Thanks for taking a look. So those are those are some of the different examples and jobs that we do. Uh, there's a wide range of, of things that you can do with a pollinator garden and why you should have one. Um, rain garden, uh, promoting biodiversity for local endangered uh, insects, mitigating runoff rainwater and pollution. So, um, and we do all those. Um, each job is unique um, and, you know, it, it's kind of a, kind of a puzzle to put together. So it's definitely not cookie cutter. So if you're looking to do it yourself, uh, you know, I will always say just kind of go with your gut, you know, your land the best. Um, and, you know, just collaborate and work on um, something that you're going to be really happy, happy with. And, you know, and it never hurts to start small and then go bigger, of course. So, um, Green Gorilla is a full service land management company. Um, so we also do groundskeeping. So like mowing, um, uh, snow removal. Um, we are the groundskeepers for the Elgin Math and Science Academy here in, in Elgin, Illinois. Um, so we do everything on campus. Um, but I'll, I'll show you a little bit of what, I'll show you a lot of what we do on there because it, on campus, we're able to exercise a lot of our different techniques in eco-friendly land management. So there are a lot of different steps um, and different things that you, and practices that you can do. 
um, some that we have already gone over. So the Elgin Math and Science Academy is a 19 acre campus here in Elgin, Illinois. Um, Multi-building. Uh, it's been a school, it used to be Chicago Junior School, like in case you heard of that one. Um, it sits next to an Illinois State Preserve, uh, which is uh, the highest level of protection the state can give a parcel of land here. Um, so it, it's, it's recognized, it's important because it has a very unique ecosystem, being the only forested fen in the state of Illinois. It's rare and it's fragile. Um, so it needs protection and, and people need to learn about on how to protect it and why it's important and why it's fragile. Um, so we use our, um, our experience and our techniques uh, with no gasoline and weekly uh, maintenance uh, in the school setting. We use electric power tools. Um, we use electric power tools to reduce noise, to reduce pollution. Um, So, so here's an example of you know, the right, wide range of tools that we do use. We can see a tiller attachment, a blower, pole saw, sidewalk edger. These we use in woodland uh, maintenance. Uh, we have a circular saw, a tri-blade. This is all 80 volt electric powered. So no emissions, no gas spillage, um, quieter service, chainsaw, backpack blower, hedge trimmer, line trimmer, of course. Um, all used in um, eco-friendly land management, you know? So it's like, it's, the, the gas spillage is one of the biggest things where it goes into the ground and evaporates. It's really underestimated, but um, better known are the emissions that these unregulated um, small engine, gasoline engines use and put out. Um, so they're hazardous. They, they pump out carbon, unlike your car, these gas powered engines aren't regulated by, by anybody. So they, they're old um, and who knows how much, you know, the EPA does a lot of different studies and um, I know you can find them out there on how bad they are. But um, by using no gasoline and emitting no emissions, it's, uh, it's just, you know, it's kind of common sense that it's better for us and, you know, it mitigates um, our carbon use and what we're doing to our environment and just, you know, helps kind of find that balance in sustainable land management. Um, so we use, you know, we do that in mowing. We don't go close to these oak, around these trees, that's an oak there, but um, we don't go too close to these trees. We have here a turf border, uh, a native turf border. Um, so a no mow area, I should say to uh, mitigate erosion and the runoff rainwater. That's so important and get that back into the ground and filtered. Here, this is the Neal building, the main entrance. You'll see a native garden here uh, along the asphalt turnaround uh, to pull in that water, mitigate it into this native garden that's established here. Um, this is really unique to the school. We have students and staff um, experiencing, you know, this unique setting, but not only experiencing, learning about it and uh, protecting it. So some of you, uh, you can see here, this Mr. Swick, uh, who is a board member of the Algae Math and Science Academy, leading staff and students uh, in a class on why these heritage oaks are um, important. And they're implementing a practice of creating, establishing a, a native garden around these. So each uh, grade will have their own oak tree, own garden that they have planted uh, to protect what the school calls heritage oaks or keystone species or in these oak trees uh, that are home and habitat to so many different um, different species of bugs and insects and um, you know and birds and everything else. So here you can see that uh, there's um, plug plantings along these trees in this turf area to provide distance and to create education um, for staff and students and guests. Again, this, you know, we use integrated pest management um, with mowing techniques. There's a lot that goes into um, having a polycultured lawn and turf and keeping it looking healthy. Um, it's not just sometimes mowing it. 
Um, so, you know, that's that that's a lot that's on a large scale and that's on a 19 acre campus, but you obviously can do this on your own property. You, there's all the electric mowers, all the different brands of electric power tools out there now. Um, they're I think they're easier to use than gas power. You don't have to pull the string. You don't have to winterize them. You don't have to take out the oil or go to the gas station. Um, not only is it better for the environment, um, but it's kind of, it's becoming more convenient. And um, one of the problems with the electric power tools in the past where they were just not um, powerful enough as the gas stuff. And you can see here that we're using it in commercial use um, in a school setting um, with all different types of tools. I worked in land management a long time. These 80 volt power batteries um, equipment is are significant in power. Uh, we currently serve homeowners associations here in St. Charles, the reserve of St. Charles, which is a larger one here. Commercial properties, getting equal friendly land management. Um, we can do this in any setting, residential. Um, again, but our residential program and uh, lo weekly lawn care has kind of taken a hit because um, we've had a hard time, like a lot of other businesses, finding help. So Green Gorilla is hiring. Um, so if you guys know anyone that's interested in sustainable land management, we're looking for those people. Um, and we're, we're a very small company, but we're a growing company. So we're looking for more lawn care technicians. Uh, even if you're traditionally trained, it's easy to, you know, switch over to this new type of technique and practices, landscape laborers, people who aren't scared to get dirty, and then uh, the most experienced people, the naturalists as well. We get a lot of um, requests for um, naturalists to come out on property. We do, obviously, we do a lot of native plant garden installations. Um, we got a lot of requests to do those. Um, we have a native plant, a small native plant nursery on site at Green Gorilla on campus um, that, <laughs> that has a lot of plants and needs a lot of help. So um, if you know anyone uh, looking for, you know, whether it be summertime work or something long term, send them our way. Um, we're looking to grow. So and, and serve everybody that's interested in eco-friendly land management, which is a lot of people. So. Um, Thank you for your interest. Thank you for watching this video. Um, let me know if you have any questions. All right, great. Thank you so much, Chris. That was awesome. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, uh, I wanted to ask if a homeowner was interested in starting a uh, turf to native conversion where do you start? Like, like, what's the first step to get started in this process? Uh, the first step is um, designated area. You know, you, where, is it, where does it make the most sense? Um, and, you know, what are and your goals? Why, what are you trying to achieve? So you need to establish what you're trying to achieve with your native plant garden and a good spot to do it on your property. So, you know, if it's a rain garden, you know, of course you want to, uh, um, a low spot, you know, uh, where the water is coming. If you want like a pollinator garden, and you want to track hummingbirds and bees, and you want a lot of flowers, then you kind of want a more full sun spot um, that gets, you know, that you know can produce forbs. Um, so just just identifying a spot and identifying goals. Um, what is your favorite native plant to put in a garden? Uh, my favorite native plant to put in a garden. I really like royal catch fly a lot. Um, I love putting that in woodland gardens. Um, just I, most, a lot of native species are rare, but I like I like that one. I like woodland species um, and oak trees. I like I, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot on site um, at Green Gorilla, so I love planting different oak trees and incorporating them into native plant gardens, um, which we have in the past. I, unfortunately, there were any of those examples that in this presentation, but we have in the past too. Yeah, it, it always, I always find it very interesting because when we talk about pollinators and things to plant to attract pollinators, everybody's mind always goes to the flowers, right? Those little forbs, bright color flowers and things, and nobody thinks of the oak trees. Yeah. And if you read Doug Tallamy's work, you see just how many species there are in these oak trees, either, you know, 
caterpillars eating them or as a place to rest or whatever, like having oak trees and, and other native trees in the area are, is just so important. And it, and we just don't think of it because the flowers get all the love. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, flowers are fun, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but I mean, but they, you know, trees, shrubs, grasses, uh, they, they play a big part and, and there's a lot of different types of pollinators out there. Um, you know, what, another thing that I like to do is planting in bunches and planting in colonies, um, you know, and, you know, when possible, kind of just kind of mimicking, you know, the natural uh, habitat and state that it, and sometimes you can't, sometimes it's a front yard garden and you're trying to try and find the balance of natives and aesthetics, um, you know, to fit in properly in your neighborhood. Um, which can be accomplished, but so those are things. Yeah, it's one of the things that I like about native gardens is there's a style for everyone. Whether somebody is, you know, stuck on that well manicured English garden look or wants a big, wild, and natural looking thing, there's a way to incorporate native plants no matter what your design style is. Yeah, that is kind of like the point of like green gorilla, you know, because, you know, some people will say, well, you know, mowing is not eco-friendly. So how can you be an eco-friendly land management company or, um, you know, or, you know, or, you know, some, you know, people are with the blowers, you can, you know, you're using a blower. Um, and that's what the point of green gorilla is that a lot of people just don't know what's available and what can be done eco-friendly. And it's just kind of taking that first step whether it be planting a native plant garden or not using any gasoline in your lawnmower anymore, um, you know, and finding that balance and that balance and the balance is different for different people and different properties and in different settings. So that's the point of Green Gorilla is to um, have these services available for our community um, so people can take that first step. And then and a lot of times what you find is when you take that first step, you'll take another step because you find out more after that first step. And you're like, oh, well, I just wanted to, I didn't want to use uh, gasoline anymore. Oh, but native plants are good too. Oh, let's try some of these native plants on the property as well. So um, that's, that, that's the whole point of Green Gorilla. And that's the only thing I can say, whatever, whatever it is um, in reducing your carbon. And that's also, you know, planting plants. We're learning more about how much carbon plants uh, hold in the ground, you know, um, but um, whatever that step may be, um, it's just take it, you know, and, and, and it's helpful and, and don't let anybody tell you that it's not because it is. Um, and that's how, that, and that's how we get somewhere is one step at a time. And uh, these new steps that uh, feel like changes are different. Uh, the more people that do them, the more normal it becomes and um, change becomes normal. So. Absolutely. You know, I talk to a lot of people who are very overwhelmed because they think they have to go from a traditional yard to, you know, six foot tall prairie in order to be helpful. And just getting people to take that first step sometimes of maybe swap out a hosta for something native, for some butterfly weed or something like that. Just make that one little switch yeah. and see how it goes. Yeah. You know, and, and, and don't overwhelm yourself by trying to overhaul your entire yard all at once, because that gets very overwhelming for people. It is. Yeah. And that's what stops a lot of people. And just because you have a garden that's not native doesn't mean you can't introduce natives in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. You, you, can, you can you can start the process slow. You can, like you said, you can just introduce one plant at a time. And uh, if you have perennials or exotics, that doesn't mean you can't you can't plant a native next to it um go ahead do it <laughs> and and i i love the point you make of taking that first step is the most important thing because having one native plant is still better than having no native plants or you know keeping your non-native garden but swapping out your lawn care routine for electric or wh whatever you know Every little step helps. You you don't have to go, you know, full bore hippie tree hugger. You can just take that one first step. And even doing that is something. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the stuff is, I mean, 
It's also about education because, you know, by trade, I'm a laborer and using uh, power tools and equipment, um, you know, is something that I've done for a while now. And some of the stuff, like when you're talking about your lawnmower and a blower and um, even, even, even a snow blow, even these electric snow blowers that we use as well in a snow removal, um, you know, you're not having to change out the oil or change out the spark plug, winterize it, take, suck out all the gas and winterize it and all the maintenance and care that goes in and taking proper care of that gasoline equipment. When it's time to buy new, maybe you think about maybe buying electric because it, it's, it works just as good as the gas stuff now. And it's a lot easier and cleaner to take care of. And uh, Oh yeah, so. maintenance is much, much less. All right, let's see if we have any, uh, not seeing any other questions in there. So I guess we'll just go ahead and end a little bit early today. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for, for joining us. This has been great, great discussion. And I always love seeing pictures of native gardens in progress and you know seeing them done is one thing but seeing that in progress always gives me that um inspiration to to get started on another area of my yard so thanks so much for joining us today and thank you all for joining us as well we hope to see you next week when we talk about green exercise and the benefits of exercising outdoors so thanks everybody take care and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.